And, you know, it's so driven by the HR departments as well, within them bringing all these people, you know, over time, um, you know, they start populating all sorts of different areas of a, of a business or a government agency with, with wokesters, if you like. Yeah, but is it the case that that younger demographic is more woke than older generations? I mean, the millennials and then the, the Gen Zs now, and therefore these advertisers, they could be targeting it. I mean, it could be cynical in a way. I mean, they, they could be thinking that this is the way that we can increase our sales. And, but I think it's possibly backfired, which is what I think it you know, where we're going with this conversation. Because I think, didn't Nike have a, they put out a statement in support of BLM. And I mean, yeah. it's fair enough to be concerned about uh, racial issues and racial inequality and, and discrimination. But I think there was a concern that perhaps that was too political a movement or some of their traditional customers saw that. And I think the market reacted the financial markets reacted quite negatively to that uh, that announcement of uh, Nike's. If there was, uh, there's an article I'll put in the the show notes that um, that refers to that. Uh, so when brands go woke, do they go broke? On the Chartered Institute of Marketing website, okay. And they also talked about. Patrick Stewart's outspoken comments about Brexit this have encouraged a backlash against his new Amazon Prime show, Picard. Though Hollywood actors are often fairly outspoken in the modern age in the studio era of Hollywood stars, they were carefully managed not to say anything political for fear of it affecting their drawing power. This is something Nike learned when it aired commercial starring Colin Kaepernick in summer 2018. The commercial has not just been controversial, it has been acclaimed winning an Emmy in 2019. Uh, the first since 2002 for the giant clothing brand and gaining the kind of plaudits from industry experts that money simply can't buy. Nike shares fell nevertheless. Okay, but it's important to note that they always saw it as a way to engage with a younger audience. Right, so yeah, it's. Um... I, I think they're. I think they're reinventing history. Um, uh, I mean, Nike has as many older and middle-aged folks and young. There, you know, there's some brands that you could go. Yeah, I could see that. You know, um, if clearly their demographic, well and truly, is. Um, they, I mean, putting aside that all younger people aren't always leaning to the left. In fact, I always get pleasantly surprised by people of a younger generation that aren't that inclined that way inclined. Um, I think they're kind of re Nike was kind of reinventing history and trying to, you know, um, cause you know, the one thing corporations have always had, you know, for quite some time is a little bit of a disconnect to some extent between, um, you know, ownership and management, you know, there's always kind of been that issue, um, you know, agency issues as you know, as an economist, et cetera. Uh, so, you know, I think usually it often will correct itself over time if management's doing stuff that owners, they're just going, wait a second. Or, you know, where they're, you know, obviously management decisions like woke are really starting to hurt, you know, uh, shareholders' bottom line. Um, and it seems like it, yeah, like I said, I was, if you like, pleasantly surprised that these woke companies were taking hits pretty quickly. So they weren't like, it was okay for a while, and then all of a sudden the backlash was starting to, you know, get traction. It sounds like, you know, backlashes were getting traction pretty quickly. Um, you know, it depends on the company and the, the particular circumstances. Um, but the stuff I obviously that's really stood out, obviously, is big tech um, and other sort of tech companies, you know, some of the hits they've been taking. Or if you like, um, in the case of Twitter, um, you know, their kind of woke stand just hasn't really helped them in any way become anywhere near as profitable as one would expect Twitter to be, um, you know, given its influence, if you like, in the in the broader culture. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, like Elon Musk, you know, when he took it over, his first and foremost thing was free speech. And, and you know, wokeness is driving, you know, this anti-free speech stance, basically. Um, but he also said, too, it's like, hey, you know, I can do better. I think, you know, Twitter's got a lot of potential and I got some business ideas, you know. 
Um, so, you know, it was kind of a twofold, which makes sense. You know, like he cares about free speech, but yeah, he's a business person. He doesn't want to take a haircut, you know, um, at yeah. least over time. He's happy to take, he's taking a haircut right now, you know, given where the shares were at and what he's offered it at. Um, but I think he probably, you know, has a good plan to see if he can, you know, get back what he paid plus more. Um, yeah. yeah, Scott Galloway, the N- NYU marketing professor, he's been saying for years that Twitter's massively undervalued, that they haven't really you know, <laughs> um, taken advantage of their the the audience that they have. And so they'll, poss- they'll possibly move to a subscription model for the people who have big followings and who are, in a way, they're locked in, right? And so they can they may be able to charge those people based on their number of followers. That's a possibility. So uh, a subscription yeah. model for the influential people, and uh, you know, make money out of them that way. Try and they want to they they want to get a piece of that action because people are do. The people who have big Twitter followings are doing very well out of it. I mean, Kim Kardashian and Taylor Swift and, uh, I mean, and people even even less prominent than those two. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I imagine all sorts of stuff are going to be on the table when they're, you know, when um, Elon Musk gets a chance to sort of get his people in there. And I think it'd be fairly easy. I I think, I think most of the the current people who are very against his takeover are just going to be, I think they're already starting to just leave. I don't think he's going to have to have, I don't think he's going to have to have some big battle to push people out or anything like that. Um, and, you know, there'll be plenty of opportunities for the, um, the, the censor type people who are currently at Twitter to go to some other technology company and censor away. Um, you know, be it Facebook or even Amazon starting to, you know, sadly, you know, you, we're starting to see bits of that too when it comes to their books and stuff. Um so hopefully that won't happen, but because um, you know eventually, obviously Amazon. I mean, no no company is immune from competition or or you know being taken over by different owners, you know that sort of thing. So um, yeah, uh, which is good. I mean, this this thing with Elon Musk is you know huge. It's landmark. You know, it's um, potentially um, civilization changing. Perhaps we'll see. 